given uh, Professor Sadi's comments, I'm going to speak in Singapore. This is what I normally do. Uh, I actually engage in these kinds of debates in Singapore. I don't know if any of you saw me debating uh, the fate of Sri Lankan Airlines a couple of nights ago uh, with uh, a spokesman for the JVP, and I think I actually may have changed his mind a little. Um, so, anyway, no, I won't do that. That's just a joke. Um, but I do believe, I agree completely with, you, with your insights. We have to reach beyond Palermo. And I don't think, you know, I think uh, this role has to be filled for the English-speaking audience as well, but we need to reach, the, reach my kind of people as well. So, uh, I think you have heard this. Uh, in my opinion, we are a feudal country. I have written about this uh, right in the middle of Mr. Roy Fox's regime. And so I said we were not going, we were not going back to our Umbrella values, but we were going back to our Kenyan feudal roots. And that has been an organizing theme in everything that I have done. Now, I haven't talked much about the other part of our overall mindset, which is the Fabian mindset. I think Keynes, who's not a favorite in these circles, mm -hmm. said something very profound when he said most, most decision makers, even if they claim to not know any theory, they will revert to what they studied when they were 25 years old. And unfortunately, most of our decision makers in government, when they were 25 years old, my friends, mostly, these days, were with me at Peradini. Yeah, I can tell you, what was the overriding mindset in Peradini? Yeah, it was basically the faculty, the teachers were teaching us Fabianism. And uh, some of us were going on to talk about even more stronger versions of collectivism. Now, the situation with regard to economics education has not changed. We can go on in great detail about this in this country. The, what we are teaching as economics, I am afraid, will not cut it in most countries. Because sometimes when I hear people talking about trade liberalization, I cannot barely believe my, my ears. And another thing that has happened, perhaps, in circles that you moved in, I have tried really hard to keep away from those circles myself, is that there is a problem of put it in Marxian terms, or determination, which is that the civil the, the war that we had for the last 30 years basically absorbed, overrode a whole sort of set of other dynamics that should have been powerful in our economy. And instead, it sucked everybody into that space of civil and political rights. And that sucked oxygen out. Even the bright young people who could have like Dharana decided to, to put his energy and his enthusiasm behind economic liberalization, they, they started running behind uh, civil rights and redistribution that comes with it. So I believe this is the right time, right place, and hopefully the right people. So, what we have in our country is that the state is occupying an enormous amount of space. If you read the report, I'm not going to, to, to take away from the, the report, you will see that the state has been expanding and expanding and taking up more of this space. And the government is doing many things. I mean, it's not as bad as when we were actually manufacturing kitchen implements. I don't know whether you knew that the government of Sri Lanka had a specific factory in a day to manufacture kitchen implements, right? I went through this stuff, right? In the 1970s. This is the world we, we grew up in. So today, to get this idea that it has to pull back from, from doing many things badly and do a few things well is, is considered radical. And I get called all kinds of names uh, in places that you don't usually hang up. Uh, some of the single websites that attack me say some very, very interesting things about me. The state, as again the report demonstrates, has expanded since 2005. Everybody knows that we had about 6 lakhs, 7 lakhs of people in the government. 
and the number that is generally bandied about is 1.4 million in government service now. But if you really do the numbers, including the armed forces, I think we are close to 2 million. <laughs> and the beauty of it is that uh, the former president used to go and give speeches. And he would say, I had given you this many people. For every eight of you, I have given you a government official. Right? And of course, I think uh, our chief guest and many others will know what the inefficient SOEs are doing, state-owned enterprises are doing. And I, was, I saw this document. This was like about a month after the famous statement by uh, Minister Amrugam, where he said, our economy is being sucked but right by four monsters. And this was like about two weeks later, UPFA decides not to privatize. Now this, now this, I'm not going to go over these numbers, this is from the report. And I'm not, my intention is not to say what is in the report. I want to try to complement. So numbers could be more comprehensive, but I think a good start has been made. Please read the report. How do we get rid of these monsters? We need to understand why the monsters have been created, how they've been fed, and make even more monsters. So what we've got are, in my opinion, a set of incentives affecting politicians, and a set of incentives affecting public officials. With regard to the politicians, let's say I actually count a lot of politicians among my friends, and I generally, I don't think you'll hear me in bad mouthing them. I think they do a very difficult job, and I try to understand rather than be bad mouth. Uh, they want to do, I know several of them who want to do good things, and it's very difficult for them to, when they have a choice of giving direct orders, go get that done, to coming up with consultants and coming up with all kinds of complicated schemes where they create incentives and provide inducements for good things to be done. They generally say, let's go the direct route. Right? They could be. <laughs> then we have the more profound analysis, which I think is explains the world much better and explains the behavior of most politicians, especially after they come into power, which come from Anthony Downs, the economic theory of democracy, that I have been reading and rereading since I was in grad school. This is that the prime objective of a politician is to get re-elected. To get re-elected, you have to have money. Where do you find the money? Apply that simple insight. And tell me about the politicians that you feel, you feel great sympathy for and you feel sorry for, for having lost their way because they didn't succeed in getting re-elected. Then in addition, we have a special feature. I think Razin uh, was very clear in saying we have to look at our Sri Lankan circumstances. We are not modern people. We are, we still carry the things. A friend of mine, uh, before the election, he said, uh, Mahindra Rajwaksa is our subconscious. Hey, who are you on it? Right? Uh, because in a way, he speaks to us. This all-powerful father figure, this king, right, that we have been yearning for, right? So in this model, if you think about Kenyan feudalism, which is my organizing scheme for everything I've done in the last so many years, uh, what the king does is that he has Zavis, he has Rade Mahathirs, and they are supposed to do whatever they have to do, rape the women, do whatever in their areas, don't bother too much about that. If you start interfering with that, you will lose their support. But their key imperative is, once a year, bring Padru Pakudam to the big man, and wait in line to hand over Padru Pakudam. And the most important thing is, when the wars have to be fought, come with the people. Look at the names of most Sri Lankans you know. Senevi Ratna, Ekana, Ekra. What are these? Heva Ge, Heva Panna. What are these names? These are all military names. Right? That was our job. Was to fight for the king. Abandoning whatever else we were doing. We were feudal serfs. 
Now we apply that to the issue of Mayday. Mayday is a war. How is this war won? Who has the largest numbers? <laughs> I can remember when I was a student, I wanted to, I was quite curious about President Prayer. So when he had the Proyasi Penum, I asked this two minds about going to Proyasi Penum and asking, did I get? Which is, if I go with these crowds to, to pick them, will, will that be a factor in success? In his success? And how can I not be part of the crowd, not expand the crowd, but listen to the man? He said, then you will break away from the event, right? So, think about that. When uh, people were protesting, Shihan uh, Bhattar Naika's removal, who were the ground troops? They were the people who had been given the Bhattar Naika. Part of their duties to get the government vehicles to do this batta business, selling on the street, was on these occasions go beat up, who beat and you beat up. These are the ground troops of a feudal society. Now, in order to do that, you really need a lot of money. How do you get the money? Have a big government and take from it. Right? So, here's your theory. Right? Now, of course, we can't ignore public officials, of whom I have been one. And what more can I say? This kind of, who I think is a good, I got to balance my, my, my sources, yeah. I've already quoted Keynes, so I'm sure people are worried about me, but William Discannon, I think, is a pretty reputable source in Cato Institute kind of circles. Bureaucracy and the public, the objective of a, of a government official, of a bureaucrat, is to expand his budget, expand the employees, even if they're not corrupt. Just want to expand their budgets. That's how they. That's how they are motivated to function. So in all these cases, you see these things working together, and the state expands. Our, the space for our initiative is constrained. Opportunities for innovation are closed up, and sadly, liberty is diminished. So. Is there any way, given this dismal picture that I have painted for you, if all these incentives are at work, is there any way in which liberty can be expanded? Opportunity can have a chance. And I think about a success story from here. I'm not going to go through all these details, but you know, I can just tell you one little detail. There was a time when, you know, the free trade zone had been opened up and the factories had come. And these people would insist that they have telephone connections. So the government would say, give these people telephone connections. Except the monopoly was didn't have exchange capacity. So then I can remember myself procuring, being involved in procuring a PBX. People don't even know what PBX is. Private branch exchanges that you have inside offices. And we have this Queuing mechanism built into the software so that when we get dial code, we don't give it up. One call goes through, and as soon as that call stops, the other one goes in. So, and there's another little cheaper device which is called uh, automatic dial. That is, when you don't have dial code and you don't want to be dialing all the damn thing all the time, you put this machine on and it does a dial for you. Increases the load on the exchange. But, much better than you have in the And get that though. I think you know the joke from those days, right? Half the world is waiting for a telephone, the other half is waiting for a dial code. Right? So, we had a director of telecommunications who actually mobilized staff to go to these factories and confiscate automatic dials. I'm not going to mention his name. I know the name very well, the man is still alive. Right? So in this context, you can see that there was a kind of an imperative for telecom to be liberalized. Right? Another little factor was this. I like this chart. This is the World Bank giving money for building up networks. They used to give us a lot of money for building up networks. Even when I was still building up telecom, we had some of this money, the tail end of it. And I said, don't give me any more of this. And the black lines are for policy reform. And I used to be told by people, at least in the old days, with these 
credits that we were getting, something would remain in this country. With this new stuff, all we get is advice on how to run our, our, run our industry. Nothing remains. Foreign money comes, foreign consultants come, they walk away. I actually did the numbers and I said, maybe we spent 15 million total to support total, right? Exaggerated now. To, to push the telecom reforms. In one year, we were making the equivalent of 21 million in telecom levy alone to, for the government after the reforms. In one year, we were making more than that for the government in, in uh, reforms. So, in a way, I'm trying to tell you about a policy window that opened. An iron triangle that got done Easter You should see my mixed metaphors, they are not my fault. They are the fault of people who write about public policy, right? So, Clinton is the man who talks about policy windows, and Hugh Hitler is the man who talks about iron triangles. So, I keep thinking about this. Ram Emanuel's statement, never let a serious crisis go to waste. Never let a serious crisis go to waste. That is your window. So, you can see Asian financial crisis. I've been working in Indonesia. I know certain kinds of opening, certain kinds of privatization. Never have got that. I mean, you want to see cloning everything. You got to go to Indonesia. We have nothing compared to that, right? And yet, these things happen because of a crisis. I've been trying to exploit this way. Because everybody's scared of the CEV engineers. But they are bit on the back foot right now. And the present economic crisis, I hope, will motivate our government to change the way it manages the state owned enterprise. So, this is something that uh, my friend Lashun Sivadhan and I used to preach to everybody. Actually, I used to, my slogan was competition where possible. And Lashun being a more radical person than me would say, that's not good enough. Say wherever possible. So I said competition wherever possible. That was our guiding principle in the only reform government that we had in this country between 2001 and 2004. Regulation where necessary because in the end I'm a regulator, I work in infrastructure, I know the markets are not working. So the issue is for effective competition, we cannot have state ownership. Right? I mean, think about that. If the state is playing as in a competitive marketplace, how are the others going to going to perform? In the world that I work in, which is policy, we love this. Policy windows, iron triangles. They were playing field. Oh, what the news. They should always come and tell me that the playing field is tilted against them, and I, as a regulator, have the responsibility to tilt it in their favor. Right? But think about it. If the government is playing, it's simple things like that. SLT used to, Sri Lanka Telecom used to get money from those international creditors. So I said, I can stop that. I can make sure that they, they pay commercial rates. They said, you, you can do that. And I got really attacked for even getting that roof. They said, you can do that. But how about them getting the money and us not getting the money? What you've done is you've got the interest rates. Even though the government is paying low interest rates, they are paying a commercial. So you've gone, you've helped us, say the government. But are you really going to, going to level the playing field in terms of Credit per se, right? Stop. Regulation is necessary for infrastructure industries and perhaps those with serious information problems. We can debate this, right? But with regulation, it's a huge problem. So, for example, in the Public Utilities Commission law that I was, uh, I had some responsibility for it, I can't take all the credit. Um, we have provisions for fining the license. But you tell me, what is the point of fining the Sri Lanka, the CEV? So the government fines, the 100% government organization. So it takes money from that pocket and puts it in another one. Now, who's going to get hurt by this thing? 
Only think the next time some uh, rural and electrification thing or something is going to happen. The manager, GM will tell the minister that stupid regulator said, oh, he took my money and took all the money that I had for rural electrification. So then the minister will get this guy. But we will. Right? So you can't just take ownership and regulation. I mean, there's a, later in my life, I have tried to figure out some way of justifying this. It does open up the information, which is honestly a very good thing. The kind of information we now have, about generation, distribution, and transmission in the electricity sector would not be available if not for this weird thing. But I used to always say, you know, why don't you tell the electricity guys what you want to do like that? Or you are now telling the regulator to do that and then try to get hold of your notes. You see, I don't even reach my notes. That's just me, right? First best solution includes privatization. Now, I'm not going to talk about first best. I'm not in the first place business. Never been, never will be. I'm a policy guy. I'm in the least worst business, not in the first place business. Right? So we have a second best solution. It was originally proposed by General Atul Giraman, MP. It was included in the UNP's 2015 manifesto. And this was my leader uh, two days ago, two evenings ago, when I was debating uh, the future of the if sure it's not very clear for you, the government is the largest owner of business institutions. Ownership is held in trust for the people. These businesses have not been properly managed. Therefore, they have incurred severe losses. As a remedial measure, all public enterprises will be placed under a public business enterprise holding for the corporation limited. Trustees will, by law, be appointed through a scheme based on consensus by the political parties and civil society. Laws will be introduced to regulate this institution on the same principles as the limited liability company. Now we have a solution which has received the people's mandate. This is, I actually was writing about this. I don't know that I wrote about it in English, but since the person I was debating was that Adroli I wrote about it in Rave, which is my usual ego, saying what is wrong with the Temasek model. So, but before I say what is wrong, then I'll tell you what is right about the Temasek model. Right? Now, Temasek owns this is the single co holding of right? right? And it's not one, what's it? What is that? Corrupt company in Malaysia? That's also a holding company. One MPP. Right? Kazana is a good one. Okay, the other one. Anyway. So we are talking about a good one, right? So Temasek owns state-owned enterprises that can be treated as normal business enterprises. That is, they don't own the housing or the welfare organization, normal business enterprises. Now, I mean, they've got the, they've, they've levied, for example, Sintel is, has got Temasek holdings, the Delco. And they've been fined, I think the largest fine ever levied on anybody in, in Singapore was the on that entity by the government, by the regulator, and the government didn't get upset. I mean, we did one million equal, not a fine, but equal, it was equal to one million loss to Sri Lanka Telecom as a result of the regulatory uh, commission. And I got all kinds of scars to, to show for that, but we got it done. They are managed by professionals whose only mandate is to run the companies efficiently and produce adequate profits for the owner. Right? So their performance indicators are not which school they went to or what blood relationship they have, but how they actually perform their jobs. Now the issue of course is you can't tell these people produce increasing amounts of profit. You know that that is impossible. For one reason, deep increasing profit, what are you doing to the consumer? And secondly, uh, in a, in a, particularly in the economy like Singapore, where yeah, there are ups and downs, it's a global economy, how can you do that? How can you not excuse them for factors outside their control? So, what they've done is they list these companies in the stock market. So, depending on competition, etc., etc., they will have different configurations. Singtel will have a much better position than, for example, in the wireless. So you can come up with different metrics that include stock market performance. It can sell down the shares, it can, of 
course, get rid of the derivative. Now we have another problem. So we have now have a solution to how to manage to assess the performance of the entities down here. How do you assess the performance of the holding company? That's a tough one, right? So they decide how much equity to hold. They can draw down, they can sell, they can buy. For example, they own even parts of Bharti Adelaide, right? Three percent of Bharti Adelaide, which you think is Indian privately owned government, is owned three percent by Amazon, right? So they can decide it's three, zero, it's fifteen, whatever. How are they to be judged for their performance? So you can say their performance is overall behavior of the companies. But we know that however well you design this thing, they are going to be held accountable. There are going to be bad deals. And for that, you have a particularly simple solution. Coaching. That is. The Prime Minister's wife, who's an eminently qualified person, has been holding that job since 2002, 14 years. So we can see it's an attack. To even this solution is tough to implement. Now I've seen it being implemented in Bhutan, and I can tell you it was a mitigated disaster. Because they didn't have a stock market, they didn't list the shares. And I was holding my head, I was sitting in the offices of the group holding. And I say, what are you guys doing? Who are you going to say, you know, Okay. So, I would encourage everybody in this room and everybody not in this room who sympathizes with the objectives of economic reform and economic freedom to engage with the government's stem cell While the policy window is open, help. Don't think that the government has to do everything and we can only sit on a side then and criticize or so whatever. Right? Help. Give support to what they are doing, right? Use our TRP, right to information. Now from the other side of our civil liberties crowd comes right to information. Any ministry is subject to, to very broad information powers. Government departments, public corporations, SOEs, right? So they're not this time when you can't get information, don't come up with any more excuses. Next year, you can get all the companies. Right? You can't say I got only information about this company. You will get every company. Use RTI. Right? But it's going to be a long game. We've got feudalism, we've got Fabians. Ingrained in our DNA models. Right? So to get out of that, to get into a different culture that recognizes risk taking, entrepreneurs, etc. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a long game. And you'll need persistence based on principle. So as I said, I, you know, I have very low expectations of the world. I'm a least risk kind of guy. I'm not even a plan B guy. I'm a plan F. And plan A doesn't work, and plan B doesn't work, and C doesn't work. I keep going. Somewhere around F, I hold the ground. Maybe that's what we have to do. Thank you.